Next, we discuss a simple depiction of the labor market. Again, the textbook that is useful in this context is by Dr. Charles Olivier, Macroeconomics, 8th edition, published by Pearson in 2021. Now, the point of departure here is that we now change the timing of what we observe. In the ISLM model, as I said, we look at the very short run when prices do not change at all. So firms had no time to react to change the prices yet. Now we move to a situation where we allow prices to change and call this the short run. And when we move further to allow even price expectations to change and adjust fully to the new equilibrium, then this will be called the medium run. When all prices and price expectations have fully adjusted, monetary policies have no effect anymore. That means money is neutral. And this is the case in the long run. So I will refer to this situation as the long run um, uh, situation. And the models that describe this are the long run economic growth models. In these models, money is typically abstracted from altogether and only relative prices between different real goods matter. So in a very short run, we described the goods market and the money market, which can react rather quickly. And now we move on to describe the labor market and equilibria in the labor market, where actually the timing becomes more sluggish because um, if prices change, this affects real wages, but prices need a certain time uh, to adjust. And thus we can only integrate the labor market into the models that we have analyzed so far by allowing for a longer time horizon. Now the question is what influences actually the determination of wages uh, and of employment actually in a realistic setting. Now for the wage uh, specification and wage negotiations, two very important aspects are the inflation rate that people expect, because if you expect higher inflation rate, you want to bargain for higher wages, of course. And of course, the general economic conditions will also matter. So if there is a recession at the moment, you might be yeah, less willing to drive a hard bargain for um, a wage increase because you're happy that you have a job uh, at all. But there are many more aspects that actually matter. And to describe this, we use a very simplified wage setting function where nominal wages, W on the left-hand side, are determined by the price expectation. So PE is the expected price level in the future. And then a function of the unemployment uh, rate that captures the general economic condition. So if unemployment is higher, the wage that I would want to have is ceteris paribus lower because the general economic conditions are not so nice. So I do not want to drive a hard bargain for higher wages. And then we have a catch all variable set that we um, define in a way that everything that increases set increases wage bargaining power and therefore the wage uh, setting, so the nominal wage in the future. And that could, for example, capture unemployment uh, benefits. So if uh, unemployment benefits are more generous, then of course my bargaining position is better because my outside option is better. And it also refers to various labor market regulations and so on and so forth that increase the bargaining power of workers in this context. So the previous slide described wage setting, uh, the um, most important points with respect to wage setting and wage negotiations. Now what we are also interested in is the price setting side in the economy because the price changes also affect the real wage because if the nominal wage does not change but prices increase, that means that the real wage decreases. And now for the short to medium run, we assume here that labor is the only production factor. So we abstract from technological progress and from changes in uh, the capital stock of an economy, which are long run phenomena. So these phenomena are dealt with the long run economic growth models that you can hear in the corresponding videos later, the Solo model, Remsikas Koopman's model, Diamond model, and so on and so forth, that capture capital accumulation and technological change. But for now, in the medium run, we normalize them to unity. And that means labor is the only factor of production. Firms can only adjust uh, labor input. And we assume here a very simplified production structure 
uh, a linear production structure where if uh, if firms uh, employ more workers, workers are denoted by N, then they can produce more output. So Y is still output, income, and so on. Now the crucial point is that we assume some form of monopolistic competition. So there is not perfect competition where firms are um, price uh, takers actually, but there is monopolistic competition so firms have some power in setting uh, the price level. That means that firms produce slightly differentiated goods because then there is no perfect substitution among goods and firms can charge a price for their own good that might be slightly above the uh, marginal cost that it has. And if it's above the marginal cost, we know that there will be profits of um, uh, this firm and so on and so forth. So to capture this price setting behavior, we have the price setting equation down here, where we denote again the um, nominal wage uh, by W, the price level by P, and the, now the bargaining power of firms is denoted by mu. And as a consequence, we then have that the price that the firm charges for its product would be one plus mu times W. W is the marginal cost. Firms set the price above the marginal cost and the amount by which they can set the price above the marginal cost is determined by the extent of market um, uh, incompleteness of, of the competition power of uh, the firms. So the bargaining power of the firms uh, in price setting increases when mu is higher um, and basically there is less uh, competition. So now we have two equations, a wage setting equation and the price setting equation. And if we assume that in the, uh, um, after the short run, basically, prices adjust such that they refer to price expectations, um, then households would make rational uh, predictions and we can use the two equations to solve for the labor market equilibrium because then we can bring the price level to the left-hand side in both of these um, equations. So we have uh, this one here, we divide it by P and we get the real wage then as this function F of U and Z. So that's this equation here. We can do the same for the price setting equation. Here it's just important to note that if we bring W to the left-hand side, we have one plus mu on the right-hand side, and then we still need to take the inverse to get the real wage on the left-hand side, and that would be one over one plus mu. That's exactly what we have here. Now we can set actually these two expressions equal to each other, which would be the equilibrium of the labor market. And one can solve this for the unemployment rate in if we know a functional form of f, we can do this explicitly. Otherwise, we can do it implicitly and describe on the following graphs um, where we see the a description of the equilibrium. And what's important here is that u in, at equilibrium is now uh, the equilibrium unemployment. And that's called un because it's usually referred to in the textbooks as natural unemployment. Now, natural unemployment consists basically of structural unemployment and frictional unemployment, so that at each point in time, some people might not be, just not be able to find a job because they have the uh, qualifications that are not looked for at the labor market. That would be structural unemployment. And frictional unemployment would be that uh, some workers are just looking for a job, but they need a few months to find a new one. And of course, since there are always more people searching for a job, this amounts to a quite large number of people in each uh, month. So also frictional unemployment will be high. And uh, they two together would be actually the equilibrium unemployment because uh, this rate of unemployment would always prevail even if economic conditions are good. So you cannot drive unemployment down to zero because that would mean that nobody changes jobs anymore. And you always have uh, all the workers with the right qualifications such that there is always a perfect match on the labor market. And this will usually not be the case. And therefore, there will be equilibrium unemployment, structural plus um, frictional unemployment that is called natural unemployment in the corresponding textbooks. As promised, I now come to the description of the equilibrium and to the graphs here, where um, we plot the real wage on the vertical axis and the unemployment rate on the horizontal axis. Now we already have the price setting equation here. That's simple because the price setting equation is just a horizontal line determined 
by the market power firm. So one divided by one plus mu, that determines the price setting equation. We have a second equation here, and that's the wage setting equation. That's this downward sloping curve here. And that comes from this expression, where the downward slope is due to the fact that the real wage depends negatively on unemployment. So if unemployment is higher, people bargain not so much for uh, wage increases, for nominal wage increases, and that also decreases the real wage. And uh, as it is drawn in the graph, we have a nonlinear function f here. So this is downward sloping, um, but not in a linear fashion. Now, the equilibrium of this labor market would be where the two curves, the price setting equation and the wage setting equation, intersect. And this is the equilibrium unemployment um, rate UN uh, here, which is at this intersection, at this level of prices and at these wages, the um, rate of unemployment made up by structural unemployment and frictional unemployment that is not due to uh, business cycle effects uh, or anything else. It's just given as the equilibrium rate of unemployment for the given prices and wages here. Now we do a policy experiment and assume that the government enforces tougher competition policies. That means that the government decreases the markup or the market power of firms, mu, from mu1 to a lower level, mu2. Now, if mu is then lower, that means that the price setting equation shifts upwards because um, this is one over one plus mu. So if mu becomes lower, this curve shifts upwards. And here we see that this means that there is a new intersection between the new price setting curve and the old wage setting curve at the lower level of equilibrium unemployment. And the reason for this is just firms have lower market power they cannot increase their price so much above marginal cost as they could in the previous case. So that means there is less market power, more production, and therefore more labor demand. And that would say that is paribus decrease the equilibrium unemployment rate um, here, as we see it in this figure. Now we do a second policy experiment in which we assume that the government reforms the labor market. It introduces more flexibility or reduces unemployment benefits and so on and so forth. And all that would mean that this catch-all variable set decreases, in our case from set one to set two, and this shifts the wage setting equation inwards. So now the price setting equation stays the same, market power of firms stays the same, but there is less um, negotiating power in wage negotiations. That would reduce the wages, ceteris paribus. So from that perspective, it would be bad for workers, but it would also shift the wage setting equation inwards, such that the new wage setting equation for set two um, intersects with the price setting equation at the lower equilibrium unemployment rate. And that means that unemployment would be lower in this case. And that's the rationale for uh, labor market reforms, basically, to make, um, workers more willing to accept um, jobs for lower wages. And then this would, in the end, imply that we have lower frictional and lower structural unemployment here, and thus lower equilibrium unemployment. So to summarize what we've learned uh, here, we have seen that uh, the labor market requires a little bit uh, longer time periods, such that prices and price expectations can adjust. If we allow for these longer time periods, we can then um, merge actually later on the labor market with the goods market and the money market to come to a, a picture of the macroeconomy that describes the behavior in the short to medium run actually. Now what we've uh, said is that wage setting happens due to negotiations between employees and firms. Often these negotiations are carried out by labor unions that determines the wage setting equation. Workers would demand higher wages if inflation is higher or if general economic conditions um, are better, such that unemployment is lower, um, or the outside options of um, workers are better, such as unemployment benefits are higher. Then a firm, the price setting uh, is determined by the firms. Firms set uh, their prices a markup over marginal cost. 
and the size of this markup reflects the market power of the firms. If there is a high market power of firms, the markup would be uh, large and prices would be much higher than marginal cost. And if it's the opposite, then the markup will be lower. In uh, For perfect competition, it will be zero and the, uh, the, the price it would then be equal to the marginal cost. The interaction between firm, firms and workers determines the equilibrium, natural unemployment uh, in the economy. That's structural plus uh, frictional unemployment, basically. And we've seen that actually everything that raises either the bargaining power of firms or of workers in setting prices or wages drives the economy further away from a competitive equilibrium. And in a competitive equilibrium, the labor market would be uh, cleared in this case in the simple setting here. And un the un equilibrium unemployment rate would be uh, zero in the uh, uh, strict sense. And every departure from, um, from this uh, perfectly competitive labor market leads to equilibrium unemployment. Now, of course, in reality, a perfectly competitive labor market uh, cannot exist. So we will always observe um, unemployment, uh, frictional and structural unemployment. Uh, so what we should actually think about is to have a labor market that functions reasonably well, unemployment is reasonably low, and at the same time, uh, this does not hurt the welfare of um, the workers in the sense of um, putting downward pressure on their wages too much if we do a welfare analysis of the whole um, thing here. So that concludes the labor market, and we will now use these insights next to derive the Phillips curve relationship.